Hello, Mr. Malo here, your online math teacher, and welcome to my channel. Today we're going to be continuing my video series on trigonometry, and in particular, we're going to look at the graphs of composite trigonometric functions. In particular, we're going to look at what happens when you take the absolute value of some of your trigonometric functions, what happens if you add a linear function to them, and what happens if you multiply them by a function. So if you find this video helpful, consider hitting the like button, consider subscribing, and let's go. So. And the first thing we're going to look at is taking the absolute value of a function. So this is any transformation of a sine or cosine graph. And we want to know how would I go about graphing this and what should I do when I'm graphing it. So the first thing is you need to know how to graph your transformations well to begin with. So this is a more complicated transformation of sine that I would require my students to be able to graph. So first thing is you need to graph that transform function ignoring that if you want an absolute value sign. So right here, this is my graph of my transformation of sine here. Now, the key is we wanna know what now happens if instead of, of this graph, I want to graph the absolute value of y. In this case, the absolute value of negative two sine of pi x plus 0.5 minus one. And my rules are going to be exactly the same as any other function. Anything that's negative becomes positive. But what types of points do I want to help utilize to know what my graph is? And I'm going to use the exact same points I used to help figure out what my original transformation was. Those points on our midline and our maximum and minimums. So Anything that's negative is going to get flipped positive. So this negative 3 on the y-axis would move to positive 3. My point at negative 1 is going to flip to positive 1. But now, I'm going to be interested in these points along the x-axis where my function is equal to 0. Those are going to be important. And of course, I'm keeping my, po my point here. And I'm going to continue this until I've graphed roughly one period of this function. And from here, if I want to know what my graph it looks like, one period of it is just reflecting what I had before. So right down to the midline. Then my concavity is changing slightly. I'm going up because I'm actually keeping my function where it's positive. Then I need my change in concavity there. And this is what one period of your function is going to look like. It's just taking the absolute value of what is negative. And I tell my students all the time, once you know one period of your function, keep repeating the pattern in each direction. And once you've done this, you'll have graphed that function you want. So taking the absolute value of some of these functions can be slightly tedious, but it's definitely doable for your stronger students. It's no different than if we were taking the absolute value of a more simple function. Now, the second type of function I wanna tackle isn't dealing with absolute values, but what happens if I'm kind of adding a line to them? So I'm going to take my transform graph of sine, but I'm going to add now a factor mx to it, kind of like a line. So the example I'm going to look at is this graph 2 cosine of pi x plus x minus 1. Now, what you're going to use to help figure out what your graph is are two lines. We know that for any trig function of the form a cosine, and this could be sine instead of cosine, and it doesn't matter, we know that this function is always going to be less than or equal to the absolute value of a or the absolute value of negative a, because we don't know whether a is positive or negative, that's why I'm throwing my absolute values here. Because we know cosine is never going to be bigger than one, and it's never going to be less than negative one. So we exploit that fact. And that tells us in this example here that uh, I, this 2 cosine of pi x is always going to be bigger than or equal to negative 2, so that's the smallest value it'll take on, but it's always going to be less than or equal to 2. So these are really the three factors I'm comparing. So that tells us 
our function is going to be greater than or equal to the line at x minus 3, but less than or equal to the line at x plus 1. And even better yet, we know that because cosine is going to take on the values of 1 and negative 1, the, our graph is actually going to bounce between these two graphs. So if you want to graph this function 2 cosine of pi x plus x plus 1, the first thing you want to do to help yourself is graph these two lines that we're going to bounce between. So here's the two lines I've dotted in this red pen. Now, what I can use is the fact that I know exactly where my maximum and minimum values of cosine are taken on. And in this transformation, the maximum value values are going to be what t where our graph is going to touch the red dotted line for x plus 1, which I put a few black dots on that line for. Now, the minimum values we're going to take on are where cosine takes on negative 1. And that those points are going to touch the dot, red dotted line for the graph of x minus 3, which are at these black points. Next, you if you want to make this more accurate, you can also try to point plot where the points which would be on the midline of your function would be. So in my case, these would be the following black point. And you'll notice these midpoints fall on a nice line as well. And this line is halfway between our two dotted red lines. So that's one thing that is useful. So once you've done that, just like any other function, when you plot these points, you're kind of just going to connect your dots to trace out your shape. And in our case, we are going to have the following graph, which kind of snakes up while bouncing between the red lines. And again, while these graphs can be a little bit tedious to draw, they are well within the capabilities of your students. Don't let them tell you otherwise. Now, this, and this is what all of these graphs are going to look like, whether it's sine or cosine. Here, I just picked an example which had some nice labelings on the axis. But it's just really going to bounce between your two lines. Now, the third type of graph I want to look at is something that's going to cause a dampening, a damped effect or dampening in your function. And this is going to occur when you're multiplying the graphs of sine or cosine by some sort of function. So in this example, I'm going to multiply the graph of sine by the quadratic x squared plus 1. And again, we exploit the fact that sine is always between negative 1 and 1. So in particular for our function, this means our function is going to bounce back and forth between the graphs of negative that function we've tacked out and multiplied by our trig function by and positive that function. So if you want to graph something like this, you need to begin by graphing plus and minus this function f your graph of sine or cosine is being multiplied by. So again, you can see here that I have dotted out my graphs of x squared plus 1 on, on my graph. Now, uh, to make my life a little bit easier here, I'm actually going to change this function just so the scale is nice. Otherwise, we have to approximate pi and everything. Instead of this function here, let's look at, we're going to throw a pi in there to give our graph, our sine portion, a period of 2. And this is just so the scale looks nice here. You can do the other problem, just your scale is not going to match up too nicely. So... In this case, now I just need to make use of where are my zeros, my maximums, and my minimums of the graph of sine. Now, I know that sine in this case is going to take on values of zero at all of my integer multiples. So, at these points that I have now dotted on the x-axis, where we're going to reach our maximums and minimums, are going to be where we touch our red graph. So a graph of sine would go up and have a maximum at one half and a minimum when x is 1.5 in this case. So 
we would end up with this and you would continue this same pattern where we're going up to bounce along graph before coming back down and I chose a poorly drawn scale here but we would continue this in both directions so I'd be somewhere up here so I have my graph of sine is just bouncing off of my red functions and going through those spots where you're zero. And we can keep going here if you want. It's going to bounce off before going up, and then it's really off the screen. So, again, you just get this sign being stretched out to touch these functions. And we call this effect where it's getting pinched down at some point like dampening and this dampening effect and usually you'll hear people say ask where the dampening is occurring well it's occurring as you're approaching x is equal to zero here that's where the amplitudes are getting pinched for this graph other instances you might see of damping graphs could be the following, so this would be an example where the dampening is occurring as x is going towards negative infinity, so nice limits if you want, but there's lots of different ways you can experience dampening and lots of different ways you can see these types of graphs. So I hope these three examples helped you, and if they did, consider hitting the like button and have an awesome day.